Okay, well, as Elise just said, um, we are not a modern code lab, and I'm going to be telling you about our, our research in a general sense and then um, uh, getting a little bit into the modern code work. So the question um, that is of interest to us in a broad sense is how to form organs and how naive populations of cells um, come together to make a particular structure with defined cell types and very specific kinds of architecture. And um, <clears throat> the question that I want to talk about today is illustrated here. And that is uh, from this classic um, picture by Waddington to illustrate the kinds of choices that a cell has over developmental time. And so he drew it here where you have a cell that starts its life with uh, many potential outcomes and then through a series of decisions which he suggested would be binary decisions but um, just to get the general point that uh, cells ultimately commit to a particular cell fate. And so it's this early, what I want to discuss today is this very early stage where cells have pluripotency or a kind of developmental plasticity and they have multiple uh, choices on what they can become and then that loss of plasticity over developmental time. Now we study this question um, in C. elegans shown here. Uh, we're particularly focused on how the gut is made um, and I have to say that when when I started talking about plasticity in C. elegans, um, people thought I was um, crazy, I think, and in part because most people were seeing C. elegans more like this, where a cell might have one particular outcome, it might not like that outcome, but that's what it was stuck with. And, and of course, um, this perspective derives from the lineage that we just heard about from Bob Waterston. Uh, and that is this stereotyped cell division pattern that worms have. Um, what we know now is that although C. elegans undergoes this stereotype kind of division, in fact, that is not reflective of the plasticity that um, embryos and, and cells uh, have underneath. And we know that from a number of experiments, and I'm going to show you this classic experiment by Jim Priest that I really like. And this was, um, uh, what Jim did was he, he was noticing that these two lineages look very different. They give rise to very different patterns of cells and you can tell this just from the cell division pattern. Um, and yet these two uh, cells are sister cells at the four cell stage. So that's ABA and ABP. So what Jim did was the following experiment. He was watching uh, an embryo divide going from the two cell stage into the four cell stage. And what he did was to use a blunt needle to rearrange the positions of ABA and ABP. So, so as these, uh, the mother cell divides into the two, he's pushing um, ABA back. And so now you have ABP in the front. And uh, what this showed is um, that you could get a completely normal worm out. And what this tells us is though the lineage is so um, reproducible that in fact you can get very different kinds of fates out from different cells. So they have a lot of plasticity in them, we just don't normally see it. So this kind of um, analysis and other studies that I'm not showing you um, has told us uh, that that the C. elegans embryo in the initial divisions up to about the 28 cell stage or a little past have a lot of plasticity and that these cells are capable of adopting very different fates. And then what happens over time is that that plasticity is lost and this happens with the onset of gastrulation which is actually very similar to what's seen in vertebrates where it's these early blastomeres that are pluripotent and then with gastrulation cells begin to lose that kind of flexibility. Okay, now um, that's the situation in a worm and of course often when we think about plasticity we think about it in this configuration which is an embryonic stem cell. So I just thought it would be good to point out a few differences and similarities. Um, both have a lot of plasticity, 
The stem cell is sitting in a tissue culture dish, of course. Stem cell, ES cells don't exist uh, in the embryo. Um, and, uh, and they can undergo self-renewal. And then differentiation, of course, is controlled by the investigator. And that's very different when you're looking at a real embryo where, uh, on the one hand, we're getting these very uh, rapid changes in cell expression and in fates. So there is no sort of stable ES um, identity in the embryo. And then the plasticity that we see is happening despite these changes is happening, as I mentioned, at this very defined time at the onset of gastrulation. There are differences between the two, certainly. And for example, in ES cells, we have these um, factors that are so critical for establishing pluripotency. There's nothing to suggest that worms have anything like this gang of four that have been uh, identified. But they also do have similarities. For example, um, the repressive transcription complex polycomb. Um, so one aspect that really intrigued us about um, these early cells in C. elegans has to do with their nuclear organization. So these top two panels are C. elegans embryos um, at different stages of development. And so I've uh, ringed in red the nuclei. So this is a very early embryo. This is kind of a mid-stage embryo. And you can see that at the EM level, they, have, uh, they look really very different. And in particular, um, the early embryo has very little electron-dense material. It looks like it doesn't probably have much heterochromatin. And then if you look later, there's this clear change in how, um, how the nucleus is organized. Now, this is not just a feature of worms. And so here are some other examples down below. Um, this is an ES cell. That's the nucleolus there. But you can see, again, that the nucleus has this big, open look to it. And that with differentiation is when you start to pick up this electron-dense material, and you get a lot more um, heterogeneity in general in how the nucleus looks. And then this is a planarian stem cell. Um, an adult stem cell, and again, you have this big blast cell, and it lacks anything that really looks like heterochromatin, as you see here. So um, to begin to, to look at this kind of um, nuclear architecture, um, we wanted to develop a way, you can't really study things by EM, <laughs> you can't do a screen by EM. Um, so we've been devising different ways of looking at this. Uh, and this is the work of a graduate student in the lab, Tala Fakuri, and a postdoc, um, Tanya Yuziak. And what they did was to take advantage of um, C. elegans, uh, how it handles DNA. So uh, worms are holocentric, as you probably know. And if you introduce sequences, uh, DNA sequences, into the worm, it will basically build a big artificial chromosome, kind of a pseudo-chromosome. And so uh, what we and others have done is to adapt the Andrew Belmont system where you can tag the lac repressor and then have it bind to this um, artificial chromosome. And that gives us a very nice way of then being able to visualize this chromosome in vivo. And what we like about this assay is it gives us single cell resolution so we know exactly what stage and what cell type we're looking at. And we can see the kind of heterogeneity of what's going on. And what was immediately striking to us when we did this is that we got this out. So what you're looking at here is a panel of cells or nuclei. That's what these little purple dots are and they're and black dots. And then all these are different um, uh, artificial chromosomes in these nuclei. And what really struck us is how different the morphologies were. And just like what we saw in the EM studies, we could see a big distinction that happened over developmental time. So here we're looking at a single nucleus. It's in an early embryo. This is this tagged um, uh, um, artificial chromosome or extra chromosomal array. And what it looked like is it didn't really matter what promoter we put in. So these are different lines uh, that we built. Um, they all had this kind of very sort of fluffy appearance, which we called a florette. 
Um, and by and large, the interphase nuclei all had this same um, behavior. However, it doesn't last. So here we're looking at different cell stages. Um, and this is happening quite rapidly. So this is 28 to sort of 44 to 100 cell stage. And we lose this configuration, this big open uh, chromatin look. And instead, it becomes much more condensed. And, um, and these uh, very compacted um, artificial chromosomes now begin to pick up marks of heterochromatin, for example. So that was encouraging to us. It, it suggested that we could actually um, recapitulate the kinds of things that have been seen at the EM level, um, and we could see this closing down of the genome. So what we think is going on is that there is a global closing down of the genome, um, irrespective. These aren't transcribed genes. These are just sort of genes in the genome. What happens then over time is that um, kind of opposing this, uh, this trend are the so-called pioneer transcription factors or the selector genes. And um, oh, sorry, here's the quantitation. So this is just to show you that the proportion of nuclei that have one or the other kind of compacted chromatin is increasing over time. And so you can see that here. So again, these are individual lines and just quantifying uh, the number of interphase nuclei that have this kind of structure or this kind of structure. Okay. So um, what we decided to do was to begin, oh, did this disappear? It did disappear. So what we're going to do is look at one of the selector genes, and this is FA4. So this was the factor that Bob just mentioned. It's critical to form the digestive tract, in particular the foregut um, in the worm, and it's uh, orthologous to FOXA found in, from everything from hydra to vertebrates. And we know a lot about uh, FA4, and so here is my first modern code slide, so I put it up. Um, this is, uh, was done from Mike Snyder's group, and it's looking at the chip data of where uh, FA4 goes in the genome. And then we've done a lot of expression studies and mutagenesis studies, and the bottom line is that um, FA4 is all over the genome, it's in thousands of sites, and it regulates essentially everything that's selectively expressed in the pharynx. So if you make mutations in promoters of those FA4 sites, you will lose or dramatically delay expression in the foregut. So it has a very global role. Now this global role makes sense for a sort of selector gene pioneer factor, but it also raised a lot of questions for us, and that was that we began wondering how you get specificity if you have this transcription factor and it's going all over the genome and binding to all these uh, genes and critical for their expression. Um, and so one way is certainly combinatorial control, and I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but the other way where FA4 has a big impact on expression is the affinity for its DNA binding site. And what we were able to show, and I'm not going to illustrate it since it was published a while ago, is that um, FA4 has different affinity binding to its DNA target, and that higher affinity would promote earlier expression and lower affinity would promote later expression. And so you could actually get um, an input of temporal regulation based just on FA4 and its, uh, and its DNA binding affinity. And so we've looked at that also by the same um, spot assay, now modified to include both FA4 and FA4 promoter to look at the association and the effect of FA4 on its targets. And what we saw was really striking. So here what we're looking at, these are nascent foregut cells, and the purple is the FA4 FOXA transcription factor, and then the green is the LAC repressor that just um, is to let us see this array. So in this top panel, we're looking at three foregut cells, and uh, you can see that FA4 is clearly binding to the array. Um, 
Whereas if we mutate FA4 binding site in a target promoter, uh, we still have lots of FA4, but it doesn't become enriched on the array, as you can see here, compared to this. So it gives us, again, a very nice assay to look at the single cell level and know when and where FA4 is binding. What really jumped out at us, there were a couple things that really uh, were very striking to us. And one is um, that FA4 can clearly decompact and open up the chromatin compared to when FA4 isn't there. So if you, if you look at this dot, it looks huge, for example, and whereas this looks relatively compacted down. And we've actually quantified that by just measuring either the volume or the, uh, or the area of these regions and asking um, cells that have FA4, how do they compare to cells that don't have FA4, and what happens to these target regions? And the data are shown here. So green are cells that lack FA4. They're outside of the foregut or the pharynx, and that's what these green lines are. And uh, the pink are pharyngeal cells that have FA4, and FA4 is binding. And so you can see what it looks like up here. So this is a section where you have FA4 and it's binding, and we're looking at different stages over embryogenesis. And then out here are um, cells that lack FA4. And we're doing this same kind of um, plotting the area and the proportion of nuclei. Um, and what you can see is that the pink line, which is to say the cells that have FA4, have bigger areas than those that lack it. And that we take as evidence that FA4 is leading to this opening of the chromatin. Okay. So here is the normal that I just showed you, and you can see um, it opening up, for example, here. Here we've made a mutation where FA4 still binds, but we know we inactivate the ability of D. We get a very dramatic opening. That's, again, this pink line compared to the green line. On the other hand, if we knock out the, if we inactivate the FA4 site, now we get rid of that opening. So it needs FA4. And this is a different gene where we can remove the FA4 site and yet still get transcription. And again, you can see that the opening is very much reduced. So we think there's something special about FA4 and its interaction with DNA that it can uh, counteract the closing down that I just showed you. Um, okay. Now, FA4 is not static, and I kind of implied that by showing you these different stages. In fact, what FA4 does is uh, dramatically shown here. So we're starting at early embryogenesis and then continuing to the time of hatching, and we've quantified the amount of FA4 um, uh, within nuclei, and you can see there's this huge increase over time. And so um, the readout of that then has this implication for the timing of expression and the affinity of binding for DNA. And one of the ways that we know that is um, from actually measuring the association with FA4 and this decompaction that I illustrated. So what we're gonna do in this assay is shown here. We have a gene that we know is a FA4 target. We also have made a, a mutation where we lower the affinity of FA4 or the FA4 binding site within this promoter, and we know that that will delay the onset of expression. And so these are two different promoters, and we're going to analyze them in two different strains of worms and look at the association of FA4 with these targets. And what we get are these kinds of graphs where we're looking at the proportion of FA4 that's associated with the target uh, chromosome, and we're also looking at the effect that it has on the morphology of that artificial array. And the data is shown here. So this is the earliest stage that we can pick up FA4 binding, and we're looking at either this normal promoter or this mutated promoter. Already you can see them begin to shift. And then 
within a little while, you can see that the wild type, you're getting more FA4 bound compared to this down mutation, um, and it's having also an effect on decompaction. On the other hand, if you look out here where the gene is actually transcribed, um, they look very similar. So you're seeing the same proportion of FA4 bound. You're seeing very similar effects on the chromatin configuration. And so the way that we interpret this is that, first of all, FA4 can bind to these arrays very early in embryogenesis, hours before the gene will actually be transcribed, and that the effects of the affinity seem to uh, kick in also very early, and that at these later stages, even when transcription is actually happening, that at that point, affinity is no longer a player. So let me just sum this up for you. So what I've told you is that the early developmentally plastic state in the early embryo is accompanied with a very open kind of chromatin configuration, and that over time, as you lose plasticity, that that's accompanied with a compacting down of chromatin, and that kind of uh, counteracting that, we can watch selector gene like FA4, uh, which kicks in at this stage, and watch it decompact uh, chromatin. And what I didn't have time to show you is that polycomb is actually part of this closing down process. So um, this kind of model, um, is uh, interesting, but it raises a number of questions. And one question, of course, is that what I've shown you today is mostly on arrays, and those are artificial constructs. And so one question is what's really happening in the genome. And then the other question is really, when I say open versus compacted, what do we actually mean? And you could imagine a number of different ways that um, the genome could be opened. On the one hand, there's the nucleosomes um, interacting with DNA, and there's certainly precedent for losing nucleosomes. Um, nucleosomes can exist in this kind of beads on a string configuration, or they can begin to compact down its thought into the 30 nanometer fiber. So this is another way that you can compact down DNA. And then, of course, these fibers can begin to loop and depending on how you loop DNA, that could also have um, a big effect on the morphology. And at the level that we're looking, we can't really distinguish. What we decided to do was to focus on this earliest point and to think about nucleosomes um, interacting with DNA. And in part, we, we th were thinking about that from a work from Mistelli's lab uh, looking at the way chromatin proteins interact with DNA in pluripotent cells, in this case ES cells, and they were arguing that the interaction of these proteins with DNA is hyperdynamic, that there's just a lot of motion. So we thought we would ask what worms do. And when I say we, um, it's Mei Chen, who's a really terrific uh, postdoc who started recently in the lab, and Kareem Carr, who's a mathematician, and you see him here with the biggest gummy worm ever. Okay. So the approach that we decided to take um, was actually developed by Jason Lieb, sitting here, uh, and that is FAIR. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with FAIR, it, the idea is that just as in CHIP, you uh, cross-link um, proteins to DNA, and you sonicate and bust up your, your chromatin, but then there is no IP involved. Instead, what you do is just remove any DNA that's bound up with proteins in a phenol extraction, and you have this released uh, fragments, uh, and that's what you analyze. And so what you obtain are these sequences of DNA that are open in that they are not bound to nucleosomes. And so what we did was more or less adapt this FAIR protocol to look at C. elegans, and we decided to do this very carefully staged where we're looking at this early cohort that we know have plasticity and then comparing it to kind of mid-stage embryos that we know have lost plasticity. So the first thing that really jumped out at us is shown here. So this is from May's uh, preps. 
And it's just three experiments to show you it's reproducible, but it was very noticeable that the amount of chromatin we obtained from the early samples was much higher than what we get from the late samples. And typically, we were getting somewhere close to four times more DNA from these early samples. And so here, we're just aligning all the chromosomes and looking at our early fare and our late fare against genes. And you can see that, in fact, there is a lot more chromatin in this early compared to the late. What that suggests to us is that, in fact, by this biochemical method, we are getting evidence for a more open, um, uh, more open configuration where it's actually the association of the DNA with the nucleosomes. And that that changes by mid-embryogenesis as shown by the late fare. If we look at this a little more closely, one thing that jumped out at us was uh, looking at our data as compared, again, this is more modern code data, um, from Jason's lab, and here he's looking at the association of parts of the chromosome with the nuclear lamina with this protein LEM2. So LEM2 chip, you can think of it as, as a way of, of seeing which DNA is sitting at the lamina. And what's very clear is if you look at a particular chromosome, the middle of the chromosome is not attached to the lamina, but the arms or sides of the chromosome are. And that tracks extremely well with what we see in the late fare. So you can see this is more open and this is less, which works quite well with this LEM2 region. The early has a little bit of this, but not nearly to the same degree. So in general, we just get so many counts. It generally seems open uh, regardless of what's going on at the lamina. We can zoom in, uh, and so here, I think we're looking at part of chromosome five, as I recall, and there are what have been called subdomains for LEM2, so there are regions, for example, here where you pick up LEM2, and then regions that have less of it, and regions with more, and these are interspersed, and if we look again at the late fare, we, we see a fairly nice correspondence where it's these lamina-free regions have a pretty nice open region, um, and then the regions that have a lot of attachment to the lamina are, um, are lacking late fare. And again, though, if we just look at this level at the early fare, we don't see that kind of, um, um, uh, what's the word? <laughs> we, don't, we don't see anything like that. It just, we generally see this opening. So here, there's a really a very dram dramatic difference in the way that the early fare behaves with the late, and that fits actually quite nicely with those EM data I showed you, where you could see these attachment points to the, to the nuclear lamina. Okay. Now, there were, in addition to this, so this is where we see perhaps the most dramatic effect early versus late. There were also a number of other places that we expected to get nice, fair signals, and I'm just going to show you a couple of those. One is um, locations that have histone variants, and what Gary Felsenfeld showed a number of years ago is that the histone variants, H2AZ, when combined with another variant, histone 3.3, is a very labile uh, nucleosomal configuration. It comes off of DNA very easily, and that had been seen in a lot of biochemical experiments as regions that lack DNA. So, uh, sorry, regions that lack nucleosomes. And we thought we should actually be able to see this kind of configuration, and that is indeed the case. So here is um, more modern code data marking regions that have the histone variant H2AZ in three locations. And here is early and late fare data, and you can see it, it lines up very nicely with these two H2AZ regions, but on the other hand, it doesn't really seem particularly enriched on the third, so it's not a one-to-one. -one. It works quite well with transcribed regions, uh, transcriptionally active regions. We also see it in some of these hot regions that you heard mentioned um, previously, so these are demarked, again, on the modern code. Um, website as, as hot, and you can see we get these whopping uh, peaks here of uh, what seem to be um, nucleosomal free in, in hot regions. And then we also get mystery peaks, and so 
this is just an example. It's not really sitting near a gene. It's not sitting near H2AZ, but we're getting um, really quite strong peaks in certain places, and so we're intrigued by, by what um, those actually are. So I'm just going to um, stop there and say what I've told you today is that I think something as simple as a worm is a good um, way to study developmental plasticity, and that one area that we're particularly interested in is the configuration of the nucleus and how it changes over time. Um, and we've looking at this both at the cell level where we can do these single cell analyses, but then complementing that with this kind of fair analysis. And we're really just starting it. But I wanted to mention it because the modern code has been really terrific for us as a way of interpreting our data as we begin to compare what we have found and what's up there on the modern code site. And, and I actually think in talking to other people in the worm community that there are a number of us in this situation. We're beginning to um, uh, look to the modern code as giving us uh, tools that we can use for comparisons as a way of interpreting our data. It's not really at the point, I think there's maybe one paper that uses modern code data that isn't from a modern code group, but I think it'll become more and more useful to C. elegans researchers as we, as we uh, avail ourselves of that um, uh, data. And then I'll just wrap up by acknowledging uh, Tala and Tanya, who did the initial studies. And that's been followed up now by uh, Kareem, as I mentioned, and uh, May. Um, and I would like to acknowledge uh, the modern code for their work. In particular, um, Mike Snyder, who did a lot of fa for chip which was great, with uh, Valerie Reinke, who was also involved in the transcription factor analysis, and Jason Lieb. Uh, many of those modern code um, uh, data spreads that you saw were from the Lieb lab. They've been really terrific, and Jason's also given us uh, great advice. And um, this actually reminds me, I think I'll put it up, um, as a plug for anyone interested in transcription and development, that in a few weeks there'll be a meeting out at FASIB, and um, we probably still have slots, so I thought I would show it to you guys. And I'll stop and take any questions. Thanks. I, I really like this uh, compaction idea. I think this is fabulous. Um, have you looked in adult uh, self-renewing tissues versus normal tissues? In other words, is this a, a, would this be a way that would distinguish those two uh, types? And I don't know in a worm if they have self-renewing tissues, but I guess at least in the uh, germline. The, they yeah, the only renewing tissue in the worm is the germline. So not and the, the germline is really very different. So you know. Um, and we haven't looked at it, it would be interesting. I think one big difference between the germline and the early embryo, the early embryo is really gearing up. Its whole transcriptional profile is about to just burst forth. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the germline is sort of transcriptionally closing itself down and relies a lot on post-transcriptional mechanisms. There's a lot of translational control. But I think it would be really interesting to Yeah, because that. that would help you distinguish it, as you say, is if this is just a sort of when you need the entire embryo to go off versus individual cells and individual tissues. That would be a good way to distinguish that. Yeah, so what I didn't show you and what really got us thinking about this in the first place is there are experiments where people have misexpressed selector genes throughout the embryo, throughout the soma of the embryo. And if you do that, you can get really dramatic cell fate changes. So you can change cells that should be neurons into intestine or body wall muscle. And what was really striking to us is that the embryos up until the 28 cell stage respond very nicely and they, and they respond fairly homogeneously. So, um, oh, I don't have it here. So essentially, um, all the uh, selector genes that have been tried work beautifully up until the 28 cell stage. And then they begin to falter, you know, 100 cell stage and on. And it was that homogeneous response that made us think perhaps there's something changing in those recipient cells and got us thinking about these other experiments. Um, so, so I think it is kind of homogeneous. One thing we do know is, for example, if we get rid of polycomb, 
we can both change chromatin structure and prolong plasticity. They track together, but really testing it is in progress. So that's, yeah. Uh, Susan, I have a rather naive question. So, Say as what? you sorry, what? <laughs> uh, no, I have a rather naive question. Uh, if as you as you change these, uh, you showed this experiment at the very beginning, which is very elegant of sort of moving one cell around and you get beautiful, uh, you know, working animal. Mm -hmm. My question is: Is the gene expression? I mean, have, has anybody followed the gene expression patterns to actually understand if the new cell is simply you know leading to the whole new lineage of the cell that was occupying the previous? I'm sorry, are you saying is the, is the, is it the misplaced cell yeah. taking on the new expression exactly. patterns? Exactly. Um, it hasn't been done probably to the way you would like it, but I think it's fairly strongly implicated. Put it this way, I would bet my one and only beloved child that it would just switch, and that's saying something. And the reason I say that is, for example, ABA, that front cell, makes half of the foregut, and that has very distinctive expression patterns. And when you flip the, but the back cell does not. And if you flip the positions of those two cells, now you're getting the foregut from that front cell, and you're getting on the order of 40 cells from it, and that back cell, nothing. So to have that kind of dramatic change, you really need a very gross expression pattern change. And, and that difference is mediated by notch signaling. Okay. And then, and that's not the only one. There are the, the somatic gonad is very different between the two. So there are a number of cells where it would be, where to, to get those different types of cells out, you have to have really dramatic and it, changes. And is an experiment where you would take a, a cell from a different embryo and sort of uh, include, is that possible to, to actually get a different genetic background for different cells? Um, so what people have done is they've gotten rid of the eggshell and then kind of mixed and matched blastomeres together. And, um, but they, they don't, you can't make a worm at that point. You can see evidence of cell interactions. You can particularly see um, effects of wind signaling on spindle alignment. Um, but you, what you cannot do is make a chimera, <laughs> you know, take a bunch of different cells and have a chimeric worm come out kind of thing. And it's, uh, I suspect partly, of, partly that those embryos, those cells aren't as responsive as, say, a vertebrate um, embryo. And partly it's things like the fact that the eggshell is important for orienting cells. But what is really dramatic is this heat shock response where you can misexpress, you know, a number of these different selector genes and see this complete conversion where you, you turn off the endogenous um, cell expression pattern and you turn on this alternative fate of whatever it is. And, it, and, and one thing that's kind of interesting, you may be familiar with work of Sophie Jariot, for example, or Oliver Hobart, and what they've shown is that later in development, like in larvae, you can convert the fate of, of cells that are fairly close. So for example, you can have one neuron cell type become another neuron cell type by misexpressing um, what Oliver would call a terminal selector gene. But although you can get those closely related things to switch, you cannot get that cell to suddenly, a neuron to become a gut cell. That seems to be really very specific for this phase of early embryogenesis, and then it disappears. Um, okay. Susan, um, yeah? <clears throat> so uh, this is great. I'm wondering about um, when you use the array and you're looking at opening, you get the florets. Um, do you have any sense, since it's repeated, whether there's variability within the chromosome in, in how much opening and closing? In fact, if you look at a floret structure, it sort of looks like it's not yeah. uniform. So I'm wondering I, if you've I, looked at that at all in more we detail. We haven't looked at it in gory detail, but I think you're right. I, I, so one thing is that when you make um, these artificial chromosomes and worms, you get different degrees of repetitive DNA, depending on you know, how much of everything you put in. And what was shown a long time ago um, is that repetitive DNA in worms, like in other organisms, leads to silencing. So if you just put in a repetitive array, if you build a, you would not see this at all, I don't think. I mean, we haven't done it, but that would be my hunch. It would be much more closed down and it would just stay repressed. What we're trying to do is build complex arrays that look more like a real chromosome. 
Um, and, but because of that, you certainly see variability. Whether there's variability in the pseudochromosome, you'd think there would be. And actually, I was thinking, wouldn't it be fun if one could do a, like a nano resolution project and, and see what's going on there? And then I thought, ah, it's a worm array. Like, who cares about a worm array? So that's when we thought, OK, we really have to do the biochemistry and prove to people that it happens on real chromosomal DNA. It's not just some array strangeness. And so that's when we started doing all this. So the, if the E cell becomes committed to uh, a, a tissue well before any of the other ones, and I was wondering if you saw any difference in the, in the pattern of those in earlier transition or anything like that. Um, yeah, the E cell is interesting. So by the lineage, just the wild type lineage, the E becomes dedicated to the gut at the eight cell stage. And yet, at the 28 cell stage, you can convert it into skin or you can convert it you know, into muscle. So even though by the lineage it's only going to produce one cell type already at that early stage, you can go later and change it. So in other experiments that I didn't talk about, we actually tried an experiment where we removed FA4, so the selector gene for the foregut, and asked, is that in fact important for curtailing plasticity? So is it really the cell, is there a big link between plasticity and cell fate? And the surprising answer, it was totally not what I expected, was no. So when we removed FA4 and the four gut cells don't know what to become, they still terminated plasticity by that heat shock assay at the same time. It wasn't delayed at all. And so that's kind of the way I think about it. And may, I'd be interested to know what, what, you know, if it fits with these networks people were talking about, that those very early steps when you establish cell fates, whether it's intestinal or foregut or what have you, you still are pretty loose. And if something else comes in, you can switch your fate. And it's only as that gets more established, you get these feed forward circuits, and you really finalize a fate that maybe at that point, the cell fate regulators match, but at this matter. But at these early stages, there's still a lot of fluidity, and the E cell, it's very happy becoming muscle, <laughs> and it can become skin. Yeah, it's kind of shocking. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>